Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh everybody. Bismillah, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'een. We begin the name of Allah, all praise and glory be to Allah and may his finest peace and blessings be upon his messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and his family and his companions and all those who tread his path. Uh, we welcome everybody, first and foremost, uh, to our uh, live Q&A session. My name is Muhammad al-Shinnawi. I'm a research fellow here at uh, the Yaqeen Institute for Islamic Research. Today's session is supposed to revolve around the first paper uh, entitled Prophethood, an Ethical and Historical Necessity. And this is a part of a multi-part series on the proofs of prophethood um, that was published a few weeks back. And uh, I mean, I can try to introduce the, the series itself and the first of uh, these papers. I mean, the idea of providing the proofs of prophethood is not something new. This is something that, as the paper discussed, has been going on for as long as this ummah has been going on, uh, has existed, because this is not uh, an easy claim to make. This is a very tall claim to assert that the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, or prophethood at large, uh, took place, that a human being that was fully human in every regard, except that, or in addition to that, they received communication from the heavens. This is a human being, flesh and blood, who was born, was uh, a person that went through the stages of childhood and adolescence and adulthood. Um, they laughed and they cried, they ate food, and uh, they relieved themselves afforded us access to the divine, the infinite, the maker uh, of creation, the Lord of the worlds. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala provided tons of proofs for this. And the scholars throughout Islam's history have written so much on this. The paper even mentions that we've been able to track down lists of over 90 titles that we know until today, that it's always been talked about. Uh, that how do we know for certain? Because it's not a matter of you don't need to prove this, uh, just have blind faith. That's a very foreign concept uh, in our religion, and it always was. And so this first paper was speaking about prophethood from the angle of it being necessary for humanity, it being an ethical necessity. Human beings need prophethood. And of course there is a given here. The given is that God who made humanity will provide for them what suffices their needs. And the belief in God is pretty much a given. And the belief in God is uh, accepted by the vast majority of humanity uh, all throughout human history. Even when state-sanctioned disbelief in God, atheism existed in the USSR and Poland. Just one generation later, people returned to their fitrah, their natural state. Of, uh, of believing in God, even if they may not be currently convinced that there's a particular religion, a prophetic message worth subscribing to. But 85, 88, 90% of these places, one generation later, of these populations in these places still believe in a God. Uh, and so God knows the need that humanity has for prophethood, and so he must have sufficed that need. He is our caretaker, not just for our physical needs, but for our ethical needs, our spiritual needs, our salvific needs, our need for salvation as well. Uh, and they tried to draw some examples that I'll mention very fast for those that didn't have a chance to read the paper as of yet, um, on why is prophethood an ethical need? And you can look at the absence of prophethood from the time of Adam, السلام, the very first human being, the father of humanity, till the time of Noah, right before the time of Noah, what humanity was like with the absence of prophethood. And so God reinstated those messages. And also you can fast forward to right before the coming of the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, what the world looked like. I mean, you just take a tour of the planet uh, in the 6th century uh, common era. And people are being thrown to the lions, uh, class systems in some of the superpowers of the world, the two greatest superpowers of the world. You're talking about 75%, 80%, some place even 90% of the population uh, were slaves, were of the slave class. 
And then talk about people being captive of their confusions, their superstitions, there being such ambiguity about the identity of Jesus Christ, peace and blessings be upon him. Uh, some people saying he was a, you know, a, a fraudulent rabbi, an illegitimate child, an imposter. Other people saying, no, he was God incarnate or the son of God or God himself. Uh, and so many other reasons, of course, you can fast forward even beyond that to the modern world where people have kind of wholesale walked away from religion in the past hundred years, um, especially in the modern world and how that caused the modern world nowadays to be in such confusion. We almost, as the modern world, monopolize suicide rates. Think about antidepressants, think about violence, insecurities and the likes. And so believing in the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, and turning to his prophethood for guidance, there has to be a precursor to that. We need to know it is grounded in something. There's very good reason to have it. One of those reasons was the ethical necessity for it. In order to be truly good, holistically good, you need prophethood. Uh, and we gave two, three reasons for that uh, a bit of a, uh, a conceptual discussion or philosophical discussion. And then there was also the historical necessity, which meant that the Prophet wasallam had to come. For anyone who knew the history of the Arabian Peninsula, first of all, God did not, uh, you know, create the Kaaba and protect the Kaaba and, you know, cause Zamzam, the well of Zamzam, the largest, most miraculous well, source of, you know, well water until today, uh, all of that just for it to be surrounded by idols. And even if you're not from the Arabian Peninsula, but you have uh, biblical roots or Judeo-Christian roots in the Old Testament, you'll find references that exist until today uh, about him promising, God promising that from the children of, of Ishmael, he will make a great nation. There's no one that was the lineage of Ishmael, the dwellings of Ishmael, that was a nation, nevertheless a great nation, uh, except the Arabs. The Arabs all knew and all agreed and all traced their ancestry back to Ishmael, the son of Abraham. And on top of that, the great nation couldn't have just been the populace that was in the area because a great nation in biblical terms could never be a nation of idolaters. And so this was foretelling the coming of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam clearly and that whoever was uh, biblically grounded or knew of these recognized him immediately and asserted that he was a prophet, at least a prophet. Whether or not their prophet must be from their clan, those are discussions separately. But asserting the prophethood of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is a momentous claim and you don't want to branch out from that just yet. Uh, and so that's basically what the paper was about. And we had a few questions that did come through regarding this paper. Uh, and you can continue posting your questions now. We'll try to get it to as many of them as possible in these next few minutes. The first of our questions that actually came before the session uh, was that, why is it that the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, was sent alone? Was sent alone as a prophet, unlike um, what occurred with Moses, where he had his brother Aaron, or Yusha was his apprentice, or otherwise. And Allah Azza wa Jal knows best the full wisdom. I mean, if we knew the entire wisdom of this, we would be Allah, right? He is the most wise. But we can try to discern some of the wisdom in this. Uh, of that is that Allah the Most High wanted His Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to be the most distinguished. He saved the best for last, the most distinguished Prophet and Messenger. Uh, in that regard, and that he single-handedly, not just was greatness, but was able to produce an unending continuum of greats that would continue reviving his legacy and reviving his teachings until, until the end of time. Uh, this is one of the, uh, the wisdom some of the scholars have discussed. There's also another wisdom that some of the scholars mention, Ibn Ashur, rahimahullah, in... Uh, in his tafsir, in his explanation uh, in Surah Al-Furqan, it's actually a very beautiful connection he makes. When Allah Azza wa Jal, he says, uh, وَلَوْ شِئْنَا uh, And if we would have wanted, we would have sent لَبَعَثْنَا فِي كُلِّ أُمَّةٍ نَذِيرًا We would have sent in every nation a messenger. Meaning every town, you would have just had to take care of your hometown, Quraysh, 
and we would have sent in every town a messenger. So why didn't they do that? Uh, why wasn't it like that? Why didn't they exist? Why didn't Allah Azza wa Jal send help, if you will, in the form of other messengers, divinely inspired or divinely commissioned prophets and messengers? He even says a few verses before, and this is the connection that Ibn Ashur makes, وَلَقَدْ صَرَّفْنَاهُ بَيْنَهُمْ لِيَذَّكَّرُوا فَأَبَى أَكْثَرُ النَّاسِ إِلَّا كفورا. And we could have sent the rain to, and we do send the rain, we distribute it to every town, but most people just don't want to uh, reflect on this. And he says, and if we wanted, we could have sent in every town a messenger. In, in other words, it's just as easy. We could have spiritual, we spiritually nourish every town with rain. We could have, we physically nourish every town with rain. Uh, and we could have spiritually nourished every town with their own independent messenger, but I wanted you to be the greatest of the messengers. I wanted your ummah, your nation to be the greatest of the nations. I wanted your reward, your sacrifice, the unsurmountable odds that you would uh, take in stride and just continue on with your with your glorious mission Allah wanted that it was for the end result to shine greater and so we have a few a few questions coming up Stephen P Holloway thank you for your question by the way as a person of the book can you define the term seal of the prophets in terms of Muhammad could that mean uh, the best of the best well the very first meaning that is entailed in Allah the Most High calling the Prophet Muhammad peace and blessings be upon him uh, the seal of the prophets in Surah Al-Ahzab this is in the 33rd chapter of the Quran is that there will be no prophet after him uh, and this sort of connects with the question before it as well that why weren't there multiple prophets in terms of space but also in terms of time because there is no need for it, right? God, from His great clemency, His great mercy, that He didn't hold the later nations accountable for the crimes of the older nations, and He kept reinstating the message, clarifying the message, so people wouldn't be left in darkness. Uh, and so with the coming of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that was the end of the non-availability of the guidance, of the prophetic message, of the divine communication. It would always be available so there would be no need to send another messenger, per se, uh, to clarify that message. The message of worshipping the one true God, alone without any partners. That these prophets and messengers did exist, did perform miracles, uh, were the best example. Loving them is a requirement to following their path, which is the only path that will lead you to God's pleasure and salvation. And so... This is implied that he is the seal of the messengers and seal secondarily will imply perfection. He has perfected the message because that's uh, corroborated by another verse in the fifth chapter of the Quran. That today we have completed the message. We have perfected our favor upon you. And have accepted, meaning been satisfied, pleased with Islam, with surrendering to me lovingly, willingly, devoutly as your religion, as your mode of engaging with God, engaging with the Creator. And so, those two are implied. Is it also implied that in that particular concept, his seal, him being the seal of the Prophet, that he's the best of the best, this is not just implied, this is expressed elsewhere, uh, even if it, it's not meant there. So it may be meant there, because God did mention that he, in the Quran, that. Uh, in the third chapter, we have made you the best of nations. Uh, that's explicit. And implicit, uh, the companions of the Prophet ﷺ, his first-hand students, they understood when Allah says, these are the messengers we raised, some over others. Uh, of them are those that spoke to God. And there were of those who we raised many degrees, meaning beyond everybody else. So spoke to God as Moses, and many degrees above everyone else. This was the station of the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. Uh, and so that's implicit. This was understood, implicitly understood by the companions of the Prophet ﷺ. And then if you go to the Hadith canon, which are the traditions that have been authentically traced back to the Prophet ﷺ, or in the Hadith canon, those of them that are authentically traced back to the Prophet ﷺ, because there is a rigorous authentication method that is employed here, 
uh, to know that he actually said this, he actually did this, he actually was this, peace and blessings be upon him. He says this, that I am the, uh, the master or the chief or the leader of the children of Adam, of all of humanity on the day of judgment, and I say that without boast. And it's beautiful that he says, I say that without boast, because we know his humility. I mean, the second uh, part of this series, Proofs of Prophethood, mentions his character. And when you read his humility, you wonder how it could be consistent that he say a statement like this. And we would be correct to assume or to affirm that it was very difficult for him to say, I am the best of humanity without boast. And that he meant that, that it was difficult for him to say that, but how else would we know it if he didn't say it? So he did say it, peace and blessings be upon him, because Allah wanted us to know that about him. Nazmul Islam, Jazakallah khairan, thank you for your question. He says, we agree that a prophet has the most excellent character does his ethical choices and moral teachings need to be acceptable to humanity at all times in order for his char his excellent character? It's cut off for some reason, I apologize. But I think I, I get what you're saying here. Uh, well, that's the thing about morality, and that is the ethical need for prophethood. One of the reasons why prophethood is needed by humanity, because without God determining morality, we're all going to have blind spots in our worldview. Like there are certain um, transcendental values, some of them, some call it, um, certain holistic goods that everyone can agree on, uh, like truth and beauty and justice. And, you know, I don't think anyone says I love lies or I love, you know, <laughs> ugliness. I love brutality. I love inequality uh, in the absolute sense. So there are certain things, but the details of morality are hard to discern because being objective, fully, totally objective, is nearly impossible in most cases. And then even if you're objective, because that means your intentions are good, your impartiality, your prejudices have totally been purged, still, your perceptions could still be flawed, certainly. None of us have absolute perceptions in that regard and you know it reminds me of Noam Chomsky's famous quote about science like okay now we have science to determine things he says yeah but science is kind of like that joke uh, about the drunk guy who's looking for his keys under the lamppost and he says I drop my keys on the other street but I have to look here because here is where the light is like we're so limited in terms of our perceptions our ability to observe the world around us even, the pros and cons of our decisions, even those are hindered. And so we do have a partial discernment mechanism called rationality, called the tools at hand, science and otherwise, called fitrah, our innate knowing of certain things, our intuitions. But the details of this or the, the, the full extent of these things, you need revelation, you need an external reference point to provide you with absolutes. Uh, because none of those are absolute. And so, for example, riba, interest-bearing transactions. Uh, what is the evil at face value? Like, what's the problem? It seems really nice. I need 10 right now, and you're willing to help me out and give me the $10. And for that favor, I'm going to give you another dollar on top, and I'm going to give you 11 And there's, like, mutual acceptance, no hard feelings, no pressure here, no forcing, no taking advantage per se, like... Uh, overtly. So what's the problem with the interest-bearing transaction? Uh, Islam didn't wait for <laughs> economists to come along and say why this is economically destructive. Societies to nations, for money to beget money and for manufacturing to get removed from the equation. It's like a whole, you know, formula there that now we understand. And so you think there's no harm there, right? Among other things, if I love her and she loves me and why can't we just have, you know, uh, a relationship outside of the marital scheme, outside of you know the family structure uh, of, of husband and wife. It may take a generation or two. It, the, 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 it's like cancer. Sometimes the problem with it can only be discovered at a point when it's irreparable. 
And so in light of that, yes, definitely. Uh, the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, holistically in many of these great values like truthfulness, like bravery, like, uh, um, like resilience, like optimism, those are clear. And then those are enough to understand that he is a prophet and messenger, be comfortable, be, have certitude regarding that. And then say there are other things there that maybe the problem here is my discretion and I'm in no place to critique the morality of the prophet of God. Like, how does that even make sense? I become convinced at that point with though that amount of his character, which is so much, uh, that I should be more critical of my discretion than of his morality, alayhi salatu wassalam. So yes, it is very possible because we human beings are extremely impressionable and certain things we think are so acceptable or so repulsive is just conditioning of our cultures. I mean, I remember Dr. Jonathan Brown, he, he gave a beautiful example of, uh, of dog meats. And he says that, you know, if I were to bring you dog meat on a tray in a restaurant, what would you think? He says, you wouldn't just be disgusted, you'd probably throw up. He says, well, there are people across the globe in certain parts of Asia that are just as moral as you, just as intelligent as you, just as ethically conscious as you, if not more, people that refuse to walk into their house with their shoes, people that refuse to look at their parents in their eye out of the reverence, like they're extremely ethically conscious, it's central in their culture, but they find this to be a cuisine, right? Extremely acceptable, extremely disgusting. And so without uh, that, there will certain be, certainly be aspects of morality, of culture, of ethics that will be left unanswered without an, an absolute reference point, which is God. Maftim Muharrami Sassalam from Macedonia. MashaAllah. May Allah increase in knowledge and guide to the right path. Ameen. May Allah accept from us and you. Keep us strong. Nasiha said, Noam Chomsky heart. I like the guy too. May Allah guide us and him and, and write for us the best of this world. And that being Islam, the best of the next world. Allahumma Ameen. If there aren't any more questions, I think there aren't any more questions. There was one more question that, that did come to mind in case anyone else wants to write anything in these next 10 minutes. <clears throat> A person was asking, isn't it inconsistent uh, to quote biblical texts uh, to prove that the Prophet Muhammad wasallam's coming was prophesied? Considering we claim the reason why he was sent was to clarify the uh, the adulterations that may have happened in these texts. And that's a very, very good question. But Allah, the Most High, He called them even during the time when He sent the Prophet wasallam to clarify to them. He called them people of the book because they did receive a book and because He knew there was remnants of that book. And that's why He, he said, they recognize him, the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa as they recognize their own children. And that's why he said, isn't it enough of a sign for them, the, the non-Jews, the Arabs, who cohabitated Medina together, isn't it enough for them that Banu Israel, that the Israelites, uh, the Jewish tribes of Medina could recognize him, recognize him how? Through the books. And so certainly... Uh, we believe that there was remnants of these books uh, that existed in the time of the Prophet wasallam among the people that adhered to them enough to recognize him. And when, when you just read what's in the article, just as a few examples of this, it is clear that the specificity of the descriptions of the Prophet wasallam that exist until today, because there are certain passages that for example Amr ibn al-As may Allah be pleased with him a companion of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam a first generation Muslim says we found his description in the Quran similar to his description in Surah Al-Ahzab in the 33rd chapter of the Quran and then it followed and he added a few more uh, traits that existed that whole passage doesn't exist in the Bible we have with us today and so uh the remnants of this without 
being a stock acceptor of everything that trickled in or may have been mistranslated or mistransferred deliberately, accidentally is irrelevant right now. There still remain some obvious truths in that. Uh, and they are worthy of consideration, definitely. Um, even if the, the complete original may not exist nowadays. And this is... It's really interesting why. Because our ultimate reference point would be what we know is traceable back to our Prophet wasallam, The Qur'an that he taught and his sunnah, his living tradition alayhi salatu wasallam. Uh, There are not many biblical texts supporting Muhammad. I think there needs to be more research into this matter. And this is by MuslimProphets.com. Uh, well, thank you, MuslimProphets.com. And uh, I would advise anyone who, who's interested in this dimension uh, or this aspect of his prophethood uh, to look up people that are far more versed than myself in this subject. And they've dedicated their lives to uh, drawing the parallels between the, uh, the Old Testament, New Testament, uh, and uh, the Qur'an, the final testament, if you will, um, such as Dr. Shabir Ali, uh, Ahmad Didat, may Allah bestow mercy on his soul, Dr. Zakir Naik, and uh, even Dr. Lawrence Brown has, uh, has, some, has some good work on this regard. He entered Islam and he went straight into writing, may Allah bless him. He has some, uh, some great confidence in this, especially when comparing with someone like myself. And al has said, you're... Uh, Loved your lecture. Jazakallah khairan. May Allah bless you and your family and grant us sincerity. Make some of this for his sake uh, and acceptance worthy. And so, Amen. Nasib, Suasi. Jazakallah khairan, Amen. With regard to historical things in the Bible, since we know that these two books have been corrected over time, how can we use these things as proofs? Certainly, they're not they're not uh, definitive in that regard, uh, but we are we are not picking and choosing here, um, in the sense that how come we accept this and how come we accept that? We say that one of the reasons why Banu Israel recognized the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam is that just there's some stark descriptions there that exist until today that have not yet been buried out of sight. And this would not be our primary proof necessarily, but knowing the history of the world, if you read the, the paper, the history of the world and the history of the biblical tradition converged on certain realities that resembled the Prophet wasallam more than anyone else, more than anyone else. So for example, uh, when uh, John is asked, are you that prophet? Who is that prophet? Is that who matches that statement? Very famous that people tug a war about. Is it referring to the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam or not? That prophet was he, Jesus? It couldn't have been Jesus, right? Could it have been the Holy Spirit? It couldn't have been the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit was always with Jesus, uh, and even the issue of the word that prophet. In definitive, it's as if there was a huge coming being foretold, right? And then when Jesus, peace and blessings be upon him, is reported in the Bible to say, there are many things I want to teach you, but I can't teach you now. But when the spirit of truth comes, who is the spirit of truth?